we're constantly bombarded by negativity. It feels like prognosis is dire. In the West, especially today, it feels that our best days are behind us. But I wanted to reflect on what's happened for us over the last 200 years, because there's actually a story of improvement. In the last 200 years, we've seen a 90% decrease in poverty. From almost no one living democracy, almost everyone lives in democracy today. Life expectancy went from 29 to 72 today. And literacy went from being basically marginal to the norm. And at the same time, while we used to work 60, 70 hours a week to basically barely make ends meet, we now work 38 hours a week to have a quality of life unimaginable to the king last year. But this is not a Panglossian view of everything is for the best and the best of possible world. Far from it. We still face fundamental problems. We are seeing, because of COVID-19, the highest employment since the Great Depression. We have fundamental issues of race and gender inequality that are continuing to the same. And 12% of Americans still live in poverty. And it's actually expensive to be poor. For to buy wholesale, you're buying things individually and paying more for everything, from housing to food. You, you have to pay to have a, a checking account, which means that on average, you're underbanked or unbanked. And schools or public schools is through property taxes. Um, bad neighborhoods have bad schools. And so the poor attend bad public schools or treated in bad hospitals. And because they cannot afford to live in the or the city centers, they're commuting two to three hours a day, every day, in unreliable public transportation. And social mobility as a whole has declined. It used to be that you could expect, everyone could expect to do better than their parents. Today, that's only true for about 50% of, uh, of people born in the last 25 years. And the reason is almost all of the economic growth has come from a few superstar cities. But at the same time, people in the cities have been limiting construction. In San Francisco today, you can only build, um, you, can, you, you cannot build apartments in 80% of the city, funnily restricting supply. As a result, cost of living has increased dramatically in these cities in terms of rent and purchase prices, far exceeding um, income, making these cities completely affordable. So where 40% of people used to move for a job 30 years ago, only 10% do today. And by the way, even if you could move for a job, most of the new jobs created, and by that I mean 95% of the new jobs created, require a college degree. Yet only 35% of people over the age of 25 have a college degree. In addition to these fundamental issues of social and income injustice and inequality, climate change is currently a fundamental existential threat. The amount of energy that is being accumulated in the oceans right now is the equivalent of detonating five Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs in, in the atmosphere every second that you can imagine. And that's for the last 30 years. Imagine that aliens arrived and started detonating five nukes every second. We drop everything to deal with it. But because this seems kind of inevitable and natural, we haven't done anything with it to, to deal with the issue. 20 of the warmest years of record have happened in the last 22 years, and we're on track to no longer have summer sea ice in the Arctic within 20 years. And because traditional policymakers have not addressed these issues, we've, as a society, turned to, to, to populists who have simple, who offer simple solutions to these complex problems. Obviously, they're not going to solve the solution. And at some point, populism will stop flowing, will be ebbing. But policymakers are not positioned to address the issues. And that's where I think I have this fundable vision of optimism, because as entrepreneurs, as technologists, we actually are well positioned to address the two fundamental issues of our time, climate change and social injustice and inequality. Let me dive quickly into both of these. So the fundamental issue on, on uh, climate change is greenhouse gas emissions from CO2 and methane. And there are four fundamental producers, uh, electricity production, about 25%, uh, food, 24%, transportation and industry. And we're seeing massive strides. So we've fundamentally underestimated the decrease in the costs of solar over, frankly, at every time in the last 40 years, to the point that today, solar is already the cheapest form of energy production on a kilowatt per hour um, basis. And in the US, if you look at the last five years, the vast majority of new capacity that has been added is renewable, and most of that is actually solar. Now, the issue is storage. Storage remains an order of magnitude too expensive, but even there, we're seeing massive strides. We've had a 85% decrease in, in the cost of batteries, of lithium-ion batteries in the last decade. 
we're seeing in the labs lots of interesting improvements in things like graphene batteries and B-flow batteries. And companies like Energy Vault are showing gravity-based solutions for storage that actually could cost as little as three cents per kilowatt hour, fundamentally changing the, the game, making solar the cheapest form of energy production, including storage when the sun is not uh, shining in the future as a potential potentiality. Now, beyond that, we're seeing so many innovations in solar that we can. it looks like we could probably address also all the, the, the carbon emissions coming from, from industry, for instance, from uh, steel production or cement production. Now, on the food side, it's a little less um, positive because as people are becoming wealthier, they're consuming more meat. And it's definitely happening in China, in Southeast Asia, and will happen in Africa. But even here, we're seeing a number of interesting improvements. Now, lab-grown meat in the future can will probably lead a point where you can have the best tasting filet mignon that, that will actually have been made without hurting a cow, without water usage, et cetera. Now, we're still 10, 15 years away from that. But humans can usually be counted on doing the right thing once it's in their financial interest to do so. So once it's cheaper to have a lab-grown alternative than a, than a cow-based alternative, it'll happen. And the reason it's bound to happen is cow productivity improves with natural selection. It's 0.01% a year. Whereas here, it's using or following a Moore's Law type equivalent. Transportation is rapidly electrifying. And you're even seeing improvements in jets, even with short-term jets and electric takeoff vehicles. In addition to that, we have fundamental initiatives like the Trillion Tree Initiatives, where you could plant 60 billion trees a year with 4 billion. So in 20 years, $80 billion, you could plant a trillion trees, creating a massive carbon sink. And you have huge innovation and companies and carbon removal technology that are coming to the fore. So all that to say that within the next century, for sure, we're going to completely move away from a fossil fuel based economy to a, an electric to, to, to one that is probably solar, though it doesn't actually even need to be solar, given that we're seeing fundamental improvements in diffusion. Now, beyond that, I actually don't think it's 100 years away, given the current improvements. It's probably 20, 30 years away. And the thing is, once this happens, there are lots of ancillary benefits coming down the pike. All of a sudden, if you have zero marginal cost of electricity, a lot of other issues disappear. You no longer have water shortages because you can desalinate water. You no longer have food shortages because you can grow uh, food in vertical farms or in deserts because you can just uh, afford to pump water there. Now, the other issue of social injustice and racial inequality, we're also seeing for tremendous strides in every fundamental sector of the economy. You know, so you have companies like Rhino and Neighborly that are giving access to people that didn't have the proper credit history to be able to be able to rent or, or, or buy houses. You have co-living that increases density, making it cheaper and affordable to finally live in the cities that are the economic centers of growth and centers of productivity growth Currently, you have new companies like Chime or Robinhood allowing people that historically have been unbanked or underbanked to have access with higher NPS and easier ability to, produce, to, to have access to the banking system with lower fees. The future of food is completely being re-envisioned, where today people are allocating a huge amount of time to going to the grocery store, picking up the food, slicing it, and preparing meals. And that's fine if you want to do it because you love it. But for many people, it gets in the way of their life. It takes too much time. Now, you're not ordering food online today because it's low quality and it's expensive. But there's fundamental forces that are reinventing that industry. With dark kitchens, you're seeing lower cost of food production, with automation, with increased density of delivery, and with increased and, and, and with ultimately autonomy, you can see a world where you can order pretty much any food Get it delivered to your home in 15 minutes, super high quality, with any dietary restriction that you have. In that world, and I think that's less than 10 years away, most of the meals will be ordered online. And it'll have a lot of ancillary ramifications in terms of the entire supply chain of food. Work is also changing. When you think of the amount of work that people do and the type of work they do, they spend a lot of time doing the type of jobs they don't like to do. And yet, you know, if, if you're a photographer, you want to take photos. So a company like Miro will help you by doing the post-processing, finding the client, doing the editing, doing the invoicing, sending it. You know, if you're a transcriber, you just want to transcribe. So a company like Rev will allow you to be a transcriber, will increase your, your, your job quality. Your slice will run the back office operations of the pizzerias. This way, the Luigi's of the world can cook pizza instead of like answering comments in TripAdvisor. So the future of work is coming today. And I don't just mean remote work. I mean, you're going to do the job that you'd love to do and nothing else. Now, 
algorithms can be biased, but on average, they're less biased. They don't have the underlying cognitive biases of humans because they're optimizing for a different function. You know, Uber wants to find you the driver that is closest to you. Imagine a world where you're an African-American male in Manhattan trying to go to the Bronx back 20, 30 years ago prior to Uber. No cab would take you. This is no longer the case today. And the fundamental issues of or the fundamental largest components of the economy that have not been digitized are finally coming to, to or finally becoming digitized. Now, it's in, in a way sad that the forcing function, function is COVID-19, but finally a, t- a quarter of Americans that actually use online medicine and expect to use it, which actually is cheaper, more efficient, and leads to better outcomes. And you have companies from Amwell to Talkspace that are leading the way. Education, which had not frankly changed in the last 2,500 years. If I took Socrates from 2,500 years ago and brought him to the world today, he would recognize very little. We, have, we are like magical devices that allows us, allow us to communicate globally. We can fly. But the way we teach our kids hasn't really changed. We had a teacher of varying quality teaching a class of students, a uh, few screening facts to students of varying quality. Now it's finally changing with massive innovation in everything from online classes and the CAD academies, the courses of the world, to tutoring, to new ways of, 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 of obtaining skills without needing to pay for them if you can't afford them. And we're seeing an, an increase in equality of opportunity as a result of that. And public services, which is the largest component of GDP, is, is, is finally coming online. I mean, obviously, Estonia is leading the way where you're like 97% of people pay taxes online, 99% of people pay their, 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 um, pay their, talking, their, their fines online for parking. Uh, but even in countries like in Western Europe, where until recently you needed a notary and Apple seal for everything, finally, electric, electronic signatures are coming online. And we're at the very beginning. We're seeing massive innovation in every sector, from self-driving to 3D printing to robotics to mind reading to, to drone delivery to nano satellites, you name it. So all that to say that all of us here today as entrepreneurs, as technologists, as venture capitalists, we're in a highly privileged position to bring about this better world of tomorrow, a world that is socially conscious, has equality of opportunity, is a world of plenty, and is environmentally sustainable. Thank you.